The heart sets us apart. It beats and ticks, and over the years it's taken a few licks. But your heart doesn't just beat for you, it beats for your friends and family and your grandson Drew. So let's make it stronger, 'cause a healthy heart loves longer. Every heart deserves a specialist. Find yours at Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican Hospitals. Hello, human kindness. I'm a Cover Girl. I'm a Cover Girl. I'm a Cover Girl too, because I use Cover Girl Simply Ageless Liquid Foundation, America's number one anti-aging foundation brand. Simply Ageless is skincare and makeup in one. It instantly reduces the look of wrinkles and even skin tone with hyaluronic complex and vitamin C for plump skin and a healthy, youthful glow. So be a Cover Girl like me and me, and get better skin at any age. Try Simply Ageless Liquid Foundation from Easy Breezy Beautiful Cover Girl. Ready to find your next job? CareerOneStop.org has you covered with free online tools and data to help you plan your career, find a training program, or nail your job search. You'll find resources to help you make the best career decision and learn about in-demand careers, salaries, resumes, job postings, and more. The website has something for every stage of your career. Find your next job on CareerOneStop.org. Sponsored by the U.S. Department of Labor Employment Training Administration. Social justice. It's the effect of systemic progress. It's not about this moment. It's about every moment. It's not about immediate change. It's about constant momentum. Saybrook University has been doing the work since 1971, educating inquisitive, informed, and inspired leaders to change the world for the better. Learn more at saybrook.edu. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. So Chris Spargo over at OK Magazine has unearthed some more interesting information, folks. It looks like Jeffrey Epstein was at least partially an owner in a ski chalet that sold for $24 million in July. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't one of the places where Ghislaine Maxwell was said to be hiding Colorado? Was she perhaps at this chalet? And Laura Menninger, I believe she is also based out of Colorado as well. So, it would make a lot of sense that Ghislaine Maxwell might have had access to this pad, right? This is a uh, one hell of a house. I'll tell you what, some of the pictures here in the article are pretty uh, smoking. This is the kind of place somebody like me, who enjoys being outdoors all the time, would love to live in. And in the location where it's at, forget it. So the question is, how come this property isn't listed by the executors of Jeffrey Epstein's estate? And will that change now that this, um, this, this has been brought to the forefront here? Now, it's already been sold, obviously. So my question is, what about the money? Where did Epstein's portion of this money go to? So let's jump into this article by OK Magazine and see what Chris Spargo has dug up for us. Headline, Jeffrey Epstein owned Colorado Ski Chalet that sold for $24 million in July. Coincides pretty much with Ghislaine Maxwell going to jail, huh? Pretty interesting. I guess it's just a coincidence, though. Lots of those inhabiting this case. The late heiress, Labette Johnson, named her to her trust before her death. This article was authored by Chris Spargo. And Labette Johnson is one of the Johnson & Johnson granddaughters. So she's somebody who obviously is entrenched in so-called polite society. Woody Johnson is the ambassador to the United Kingdom. The Johnsons are obviously a very, very well-to-do family, and it doesn't strike me as a shock or as odd that someone in the Johnson family would have been this wrapped up with Epstein, right? It just It's just par for the course at this point. Jeffrey Epstein had a massive real estate empire. 
that included an apartment in Paris, two islands in the Caribbean, a Palm Beach mansion, a massive New York townhouse, and a ranch in New Mexico. But O.K. has obtained paperwork revealing these were not his only properties. One thing he kept secret was another, never-before-disclosed sex chalet. That's a pretty interesting way to put it, huh? A sex chalet? Now, we know everywhere Epstein went, he was molesting girls and young women, and obviously, the question has to be asked now that we found this, you know, find out that he has this secret uh, ski chalet, were any girls in Colorado involved in this pyramid scheme, meaning any of these miners that lived close by, or were they flown in there to be abused? It's a, uh, again, another avenue that we have to travel down. There are more questions than answers in this case. And while I'm obviously no expert on these sorts of matters when it comes to federal cases or anything like this, I mean, it can't be every single case that just you add more questions and more questions every time you think you're answering, uh, uh, getting an answer, right? Because that's certainly what seems to happen here. Every day we wake up, we'll have a little bit of, uh, of a lull in information, maybe a day or two, and then bam, we learn something new. Bam, something else comes up that opens up a whole bunch of new questions. And that's just the way it seems to go with this case, right? And it's, it's crazy. I've never seen anything like it. In 1997, Epstein became an owner of a ski chalet in Vail, Colorado that just sold this past July for $24 million. Now, Vail is as high-end as it gets when you're talking about ski towns, ski resorts, and I've been fortunate enough to go to, to visit Vail, and you're talking the upper crust, big-time big time money. So... Just from the pictures alone of this place, it is just I, it, an incredibly beautiful property, no doubt about it. But the real question is, if this was sold in July and Epstein was at least part owner of it, where did that money go? It should go to the trust and to the survivors, right? I wonder who received this money. Was it his brother? Was it Indyke? Was it Khan? I don't know. I'm just asking some questions around these parts. Documents show that the property was purchased in 1994 by Elizabeth Ross Labette Johnson, the great-granddaughter and the co-founder of Johnson & Johnson. She is one of those rare individuals who was known to be a client of Epstein, and a few years into their professional relationship, Epstein got Labette to make him an owner of her property. So it just goes for the the usual with the Johnsons. I mean, they own the New York Jets football team, which is an absolute clown show on a dumpster fire. Terrible judgment shown as far as being football executives. So why, why should it shock us that somebody from the Johnson family would exhibit terrible, um, would exhibit terrible, um, a show of, of decision-making by hanging out with somebody like Jeffrey Epstein and not only hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein, being one of his clients. So, what do the other Johnsons know? Do are any of anyone else in the Johnson family aware of what occurred here? Did anybody else in the Johnson family have any sort of financial ties to Jeffrey Epstein? Again, this opens up a whole bunch of different questions. A 1998 property transfer that is dated May 13th and signed by both Johnson and Epstein transfers the property from the heiress to a trust set up in her name by the pedophile. The document is only signed by those two individuals along with the appropriate notaries and clerks, but none of Labette's heirs. So Epstein was probably hustling this old lady, right? Probably had the, the screws turned to her turning on that charm real thick, was probably introduced to her by, to her by uh, Les Wexner, and she thought she was getting herself a hell of a score here, somebody that knew how to play the markets, Jeffrey Epstein so sharp. Meanwhile, she had no idea, probably, that she's getting in bed with this bipedal serpent. Then again, maybe she did, right? 
if I'm going to continue to be the cynic that I have become, as we have followed this case from the beginning, well, then she was probably another enabler, right? Somebody who knew that Jeffrey Epstein was a scuzzbag, et cetera, et cetera. Or, again, maybe Epstein was working her and scamming her as well. Who knows? The fact of the matter is this, though. This property was not listed as far as entities owned by Jeffrey Epstein or properties owned by Jeffrey Epstein. And that means that this money was directed somewhere and that somewhere is not the survivor's fund. So I think that is the most important thing here. The document states that Epstein can convey, encumber, lease, or otherwise deal with interest in the property. That gave him the same rights to the chalet as Labette. There was never a change to that trust before the house sold this year, and the deed references the owner as being the trust as created in, in, in the May 1998 document. The deed for the property was signed by Labette's daughter, Annabelle Teal, in her capacity as a trustee of the estate. So, it wasn't just uh, old woman Johnson here, huh? She had her daughter involved, they looked at it. So, okay, I'm guessing that she wasn't being jobbed by Epstein. She was just another person who thought that Epstein was a great guy. Boy, aren't all of these members of so-called polite society such good people to judge character? It is unclear if Epstein then received half of the sale from this home, or if he had listed himself as a grantee to run some sort of financial scheme. Well, I wouldn't doubt that. I mean, what have we talked about with the Finson files? We know that Epstein was up to his neck in money laundering and all sorts of financial irregularities, so it would be perfectly right in order with his M.O. for him to do so here. It is similar to what he had done with Les Wexner when he inherited his Upper East Side townhouse from the L Brands founder. If he was, in fact, still an owner of the chalet, then the money would go to his brother Mark Epstein, but the government does not seem to be aware of the property. Well, you know what? Would that shock you after what we've learned from the Department of Justice recently? Would it shock you to know that they did a piss poor job of unearthing all of Epstein's holdings? And also it goes to exactly what I said would happen. There is a lot more money buried around Jeffrey Epstein's world than what was down on paper. That's like looking at someone's tax returns and saying, oh yeah, well his tax returns are fine, so this person is obviously not involved in any kind of financial scheming. Well, of course not. They're not going to report their ill-gotten gains. Just like Jeffrey Epstein is not going to report all of his finances. And I guarantee you Indyke and Khan know more than they're letting on. Those two idiots should be arrested, in my opinion, and they both should be put under oath, and they should both be facing serious charges for their role in facilitating all of this. It is one of the one of two Epstein properties not listed in the breakdown of his assets provided by his executors to the courts. It is also worth noting that it was not sold during Labette's lifetime despite the fact that she stopped going to Vail. She became increasingly reclusive as she battled Alzheimer's towards the end of her life, though prior to that did occasionally appear at social functions, sometimes on the arm of one-time boyfriend and Epstein pal Frederick Fakai. And you'll remember that guy as one of the stylists, the hair the hairstylist um, who owned the um, the salon where Jeffrey Epstein would send the girls to go get haircuts, to go get chopped up and to look like the way he wanted them to look and to be put into that nice little, uh, that little cookie cutter ideal that Jeffrey Epstein loved to go for. I did an article and a episode about Fakai and about how he was definitely an enabler of Jeffrey Epstein, definitely somebody who has been mentioned by the survivors, Virginia and others, and he is somebody who has thus far avoided a lot of attention, but he really should get some. 
And I think as we're moving forward here and we have a couple of those lulls like I was talking about, maybe we'll go back and we'll dive deeper into Frederick Fakai and his dealings with Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein because he wasn't just an outer fringe friend, right? This is somebody who was close enough that Epstein would send the girls down to his salon for them to have their makeovers and stuff. So, I mean, Fakai would have to have been as blind as a bat to not understand what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein and all of these young girls. You know, we're not talking about a guy who's running around looking like, you know, uh, Brad Brad Pitt in his prime, all right? We're talking about Jeffrey Epstein's goofy ass, big ol' eared ass, no sense of style, no sense of anything. If it wasn't for the money and the power, forget about it. As for the property, the Stockton Group described the chalet as such. A home site chosen by the, in, the original investors of Vail for its unparalleled access to the ski slopes, unobstructed views of the Gore Range, and pristine natural surroundings. This home combines timeless luxury with impeccable craftsmanship while absorbing the incredible history of this premier ski-in, ski-out location. Off the backyard is the Golden Peak Base Area and Riva Bon High Speed Quad, a legacy property with unmatched privacy and proximity to the Ski Mountain. And again, make sure you check out the um, article. It not only has pictures, but it has the deed that Chris Spargo dug up and it's posted here as well. So definitely make sure you go into the description box, you check out all of the links, and you click on the link for OK Magazine and come and check this out because you'll be blown away by these pictures. If you're not familiar with Vail especially or ski towns in general, then you'll take a look at this and you'll just shake your head. These people had everything, folks. The world at their feet. And what did they choose to do with all of that power and all of that great privilege? It's sad, disgusting, and gross if you ask me. The 7,738 square foot home is located on half an acre of land and has seven bedrooms, seven full bathrooms, multiple fireplaces, an elevator, and a pool. So, Jeffrey Epstein had himself a little hidey hole in Colorado where Ghislaine Maxwell was said to be hiding, and where Laura Menninger is based. I guess it's all coincidence, though, right? I My real guess, though, and my speculation here is, obviously, just my opinion, is that at some point during the time where Ghislaine Maxwell was on the lam, she spent a little bit of that time at this Colorado property. That would be my guess. And that would also be why... In my opinion, it was sold in July as well. It coincides with Ghislaine Maxwell heading to prison. Now, where did that money go? That's the question I leave all of you with as we sign off this morning here on the Jeffrey Epstein Show. If you'd like to contact me, you could do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode are in the description box. And to everybody who has donated to the podcast, thank you folks very much. We have another trip to New Mexico that is in the works as we speak. I am thinking about lining up mid to late February once again, depending, obviously, on all of these coronavirus restrictions that are now into play. We'll see how everything looks in February, but my plan now is February, middle of February, end of February, to get back down to Zorro Ranch, back down to Santa Fe, and I'd really like to get out to Los Alamos for a little while and spend a little bit more time up at the Santa Fe Institute. I only spent a little bit of time there, a few hours, and I didn't really get to talk to too many people. So I'm going to make it a point to spend a lot more time on the campus at Santa Fe Institute this next trip. 
So anyway, folks, that's a bit of an update about what I have in the works. And obviously, July, I'll be back in New York for the trial. But besides that, we're going to keep grinding and we'll see what we see, right? All right, everybody. I'll catch you folks later. Fact. Three billion of us worldwide depend on seafood as a key source of protein. And yet, overfishing is the number one threat to our ocean. Sorry, three billion people. How about switching your fish night to something sustainable? Try Good Catch Foods for 100% plant-based seafood that is truly off the hook. Saving the ocean feels good, and the taste? Delicious. Go to goodcatchfoods.com to learn more, or shop online. Rogue Nicotine On Demand. Delivered direct to your door. Available in all your favorite flavors and formats. Pouches, gum, wintergreen, peppermint, and more. From your Monday morning coffee to watching hoops to dinner at the in-laws, Rogue Nicotine is there for you when you need it. Visit roguenicotine.com today and save 10% when you place your order for sugar-free, fast-acting Rogue Nicotine. Underage sales prohibited. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. For more information, visit roguenicotine.com. The heart sets us apart. It beats and ticks. And over the years, it's taken a few licks. But your heart doesn't just beat for you. It beats for your friends and family and your grandson, Drew. So let's make it stronger. Because a healthy heart loves longer. Every heart deserves a specialist. Find yours at Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican Hospitals. Hello, human kindness. Find your future with a military-friendly school. Helping service members, veterans, and military families earn a high-quality education for nearly 50 years. Learn more today about how Columbia College supports our military community 